Hey everyone, uh, I am traveling a good distance this evening. Um, and so Dr. Eversen was gracious enough to let me record my piece on power to the profession. Uh, so I am gonna go over that now. Uh, so basically I just kind of wanted to talk to you about what is power to the profession. Um, and then who is kind of behind this initiative of Power to the Profession. Um, <clears throat> so Power to the Profession was born out of a response to the 2015 report by the National Academy of Medicine that highlighted a need for a more unified early childhood workforce. Um, and this theme of, you know, um, needing a more unified early childhood field in general is sort of, um, it's been overarching in a lot of the readings that we've done and um, and the textbooks, but um, some stakeholders in the field um, kind of bonded together over this need. Um, and, and what the process looked like then was it was about 36 months long and they have gone through eight decision cycles. I and mean, these decision cycles involved um, engagement with over 11,000 individuals in the form of surveys, focus groups. Um, they did some one on one interviews. There have also been webinars and conference sessions conducted around um, kind of the vision for Power to the Profession. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more when I get into the who is um, part, but there have been people. Um, you know, directly working in the field, people in more administrative um, policy making roles, um, all sorts of, of individuals kind of at the table for this conversation. And so what resulted from these eight decision cycles and this um, three years long process was that power to the profession has been able to articulate a shared vision for early childhood education using the input of um, folks from the field, advocates and allies for early childhood ed. Um, some of the key things that they articulate in that vision um, are they have they have determined that there should be three professional designations. Um, they call them early childhood educator one, two, and three. Um, and those are kind of outlined in terms of level of mastery. And so each uh, category, level one, two, or three, would have different roles and responsibilities um, in the field in their work. Along with those, they have aligned professional preparation pathways um, or specializations so that a certificate or a credentialing program aligns with the ECE-1, um, associate programs align with ECE-2, and then at the level three, you're looking at any bachelor's or initial master's program uh, in terms of professional prep um, to achieve that level three. Uh, they also advocate very clearly for professional compensation. So a lot of the work that is being done through Power to the Profession is, um, is advocating for policy change that would uh, allow for comparable benefits based on, I'm mean, sorry, comparable pay and compensation based on uh, qualifications, as well as a benefits package. Um, and they are arguing for increase in compensation with increased training and competence in the field. Uh, and, and also stating very clearly that differences in pay should not be based on ages of children served. Um, it has been my experience, um, and I think could largely be kind of said of the field that um, because of um, you know pre-K funding and things like that at the state level, that uh, preschool licensed teachers tend to be better compensated than say teachers serving infants and toddlers, um, just because there is more money funneling down from the federal and state levels to support preschool programs at this point. Um, and so they are arguing that that should not be the case and that um, teachers serving children younger than preschool age should also be uh, adequately and comparably compensated. 
Um, and kind of along those same lines, they are advocating for supportive infrastructure. And they argue that this needs to happen at all levels that impact a program. So programmatic levels, local levels, state and federal levels of infrastructural change in order to achieve um, these, these goals that they have uh, developed. Um, there on the Power to the Profession website, they have also outlined what they call implementation commitments. Um, and basically they, they have articulated a commitment to building a future that demonstrates learning from the past. So I've included a couple of examples of those just to kind of give you a sense of what is meant by that idea of implementation commitment. But basically they are saying um, like, we're not gonna advocate for increased educational requirements without advocating for funding to provide um, supports and compensation that, that are in line with increasing educational requirements. So I think traditionally in the field, we have seen you know, this push for higher quality, um, more teacher prep and training, but there is no uh, compensation or support to go along with that. So you're left with you know, um, minimally paid workers trying to further their education um, and you know, pay for college degrees and professional development opportunities and things like that, that just really from a, a budgetary and financial perspective don't make a whole lot of sense. So they're trying to advocate for um, support, you know, for the, the push for quality from a financial standpoint. Um, and then another one that they, they stated on the website was, we will not advocate for policies that disproportionately and negatively impact educators from communities of color. Uh, one thing that was pretty much made apparent in a lot of the language um, and the kind of presentation of this power to the profession is that it is very focused on um, being equitable and um, you know, attainable, accessible for people um, from all walks of life in, in the early childhood field. Um, and so I think that's kind of a, a statement to articulate um, that idea there. And finally, uh, just in terms of kind of what is power to the profession, um, the ideas that they have presented as their vision um, and their you know, push for state professional development, is it, it, they've all been sort of organized around these four policy principles. And so this is, is sort of the focus of the advocacy efforts um, of this initiative. They're looking at system integration, um, in and across, you know, disciplines that that relate to early childhood. They're looking at quality assurance and quality control measures, workforce diversity, and compensation parity. And I've kind of spoken to all of those um, in what I've shared so far, but that's just kind of to give you a framework of how they have organized their thinking. So then who is power to the profession? Power to the Profession is supported by a number of funders and donors. Um, I just listed a few here, the Alliance for Early Success, the Gates Foundation, Foundation for Child Development, Kellogg Foundation. There's a, a lengthy list. These are just some of the more well-known names that I chose to share. Um, and then, so those are um, funders and donors. The actual task force, national task force, that has been doing the legwork um, to, you know, get all of the engagement from different participants and then to organize um, those decision cycles, that is comprised of about 15 organizations that pretty well represent the field of early childhood ed. Um, so those include Child Care Aware of America, um, the Division of Child Development and Early Education, National Association for the Education of Young Children, other organizations like National Head Start Association, Zero to Three. Um, again, I just picked some of the kind of big names to share with you. Um, but the, the work that this task force has been directly responsible for after all of the organization of ideas is that they have established what they call a unifying framework for the early childhood profession. Um, and I believe Karen is gonna be sharing about that. So I don't wanna steal any of her thunder. I'm just gonna leave it at that, that that is work that has come out of power to the profession. Um, and then they have also defined a vision for public investment uh, so that all children can benefit from high quality early childhood ed. 
Um, and, and what this really looks like is, again, back to that idea of um, high quality training and preparation for a well compensated workforce. Uh, so that's really kind of the one of the main focuses of, of their advocacy efforts. Uh, and then in addition to funders and donors, the National Task Force, there are also stakeholders. Um, stakeholders include lots of other agencies and organizations who have sort of bought into uh, the principles and the, the policies and policy changes that the Power to the Profession is trying to see. Um, and so right now there are about 38 stakeholders um, Again, I've just included kind of a, a list of highlights here for you, but if you go to um, powertotheprofession.org, you can find uh, lots of information beyond what I've shared here about this initiative um, and how to get involved yourself, actually, if that's of interest to you. Uh, so I'm just going to pose my discussion questions, and then I am going to uh, let you all sort of facilitate that conversation in my absence. But the things that I wanted you to think about after I've shared are, um, how do you see power to the profession connecting to the new realities that were shared? And which one do you think that it primarily, which ones do you think that um, this initiative primarily relates to? which um, of the new realities is best demonstrated through this initiative. Um, are there any ideas from our textbook leadership in action that you see exemplified in Power to the Profession? And then finally, how do you think that we as a field move forward from this kind of visionary strategic planning into a clear course of action for early childhood education? Um, at the kind of macro and micro levels, what can we as professionals in the field be doing to kind of move this work forward? And that's what I have for you. Thank you so much.